We are here with astronaut Katie Coleman. Good to have you with us as always. Thanks for stopping by. I know you spent two trips on the shuttle, six months on the International Space Station. Astronaut Scott Kelly is coming back after almost a year, 11 months and some days, just about double the time you were there, remembering, imagining your own experience times two. What's it like to literally I mean, come back down to Earth after that much time in space, that much time weightless? Well, first of all, I'll go on the record and say that most of us are just insanely jealous of Scott. <laughs> that I, I remember being you know, scheduled to come home after six months and wishing so much so that I could stay another six. And it's not just in my imagination. I just specifically remember this moment because it takes a little, it takes a long time to get good at the things that we do up there, mm. the different experiments and just efficient and doing, just working in zero gravity when everything floats around. And it's, it's really uh, clear when you're up there how important the work is and that every minute that you can get more work done is gonna be important to everybody down here on earth. And so you really wanna stay longer and do that you know by then that your family's actually going to be fine and they'll be there when you get home. And so I wanted to come home, just not quite yet. I think for Scott, I mean, the reality then of a year-long mission uh, is, is, is certainly harder than probably what I was imagining. I was actually up there for uh, almost four months with Scott uh, on, on uh, his first space station mission. And he's, he's somebody who, who knows how to pace himself. He's a really even-keeled kind of guy. He's interested in a lot of different things. And I loved actually being up there in some ways more than I probably thought I would have. <laughs> Dumb, <clears throat> curious, earthbound person question. The thing that strikes me is just, just getting used to gravity again, whether it's you know, picking up a little thing or picking up your own feet has got to be quite a feeling for at least a couple of days. Well, first there's the walking on them. You know, these feet have not really walked on anything except a treadmill probably once a day for an, about an hour. And we actually lose all the calluses on our feet. They're like baby soft on the bottom. But then on the top, we, we get calluses because we're used to sort of sliding them under little handrails to kind of hold ourselves in place with our feet. So there's that part. Um, it's, it's mostly your head. Your, your head is just really not used to gravity. And you're used to just with the touch of a finger being able to push yourself across the whole space station. And the demonstration that I like to show is if you take one hair from your head and you pull that hair between your fingers uh, and then you use it against you know, something and just push gently, you will push yourself across that space station. So that means when you get back on Earth, every step is like an earthquake to your head. And it takes a little while for you to walk a, a straight line. And even after, I'd say, three days, Walking a straight line, if you then shut your eyes while you're doing that, it's all over. <laughs> because he is an identical twin, Scott Kelly's brother Mark, also an astronaut, well-known to a lot of folks as the husband of uh, Congresswoman Gabby Giffords, but Scott's year in space really presented a unique opportunity for medical research to look at really the same body in a way. His brother stays on Earth for the year, his identical twin. He's in space. They can compare and contrast medically, physically. What happened to the guy who was in space for a year? What happened to basically his body while it stayed on Earth for that same period? That's fascinating in itself, and I presume it's pretty important for planning for future longer term space travel. It's, it's such an amazing opportunity, and, and we, you know, the, the results will continue for years, really, to come in as we watch the two of them, so to speak. When you think about wanting to send people to Mars, which is what, what is next? I mean, it's not the immediate next step, but it is certainly what we look at and what we work very actively towards at NASA. And we want those people to be safe. They're never going to be exactly safe, but as safe as we can do it. And so we want to understand what they're going through, what the radiation means, what the, the bone loss issues are, those kinds of things. The numbers that we get to study that with are so small. I mean, every drug that any of us ever take, you know, has thousands and thousands and thousands of people involved in trials and years of history. And yet I think there's only about 500 or so that have ever been to space. And when you think of, I mean, so there's just very few. And I think of those, you know, in terms of Americans, in terms of the testing being consistent within a country, um, you know, a couple hundred. And so... The fact that we can get that kind of specific data, two twins, 
is, is really, really valuable to us. I remember in the earlier days of the space program, when they were first going for longer flights, I think it was a Gemini flight that was going to be two weeks. Mm -hmm. And I remember one of the NASA doctors at that time talking on TV about things they were worried about, calcium depletion in bones, blood pooling in the extremities because of no uh, gravity, muscle atrophy, and even the expose, uh, increased exposure to radiation. This was gonna be two weeks. The testing and the examining of astronaut Scott Kelly that's going to be going on for weeks, months, years, as you say, really is gonna be something, isn't it? Well, and, and actually, you know, rightly so, we, we all go through it. And because it's such valuable information. I like to tell people that we, I get a physical, you know, once a year for the rest of my life, whether I like it or not. And every time some, one of us has something taken out, everybody wants to see it, right? Um, but on, in a more serious way, you know, everything that you mentioned, there's, there's kind of a glass half full and a glass half empty way to think about them. Bone loss. I mean, none of us want to have bone loss. And at the same time, when we are up there in space, we lose bone 10 times faster than a woman who has osteoporosis who is 70 years old. So what she loses in a year, somebody like myself or Scott loses in a month if we don't do something about it. And so we're testing out countermeasures like exercise and diet and vitamins and drugs, different things. And because, I mean, so the bad news is that it happens very quickly to us. The good news is that because it happens so quickly, we can take blood and urine and all those kinds of samples. And also, even though there are few of us in the numbers, we say the number N, meaning N people, 15 people, 30 people, 500 people, There's, those numbers are all still very small when it comes to medical studies. But they, they're a little bit more significant than usual because we all have sort of this very even, um, uneventful medical history that makes us a nice baseline and easier to study than, for example, a population of 70-year-olds with osteoporosis. So there's a lot of earth benefits that I'm quite proud of uh, being, being part of, even though our primary goal is actually to understand what happens to people for the longer journey to go further out into the solar system and onto Mars. On to Mars. Let's talk about that. That's what everybody at NASA, from what you tell me, is looking at, thinking about, focusing on, you know, the latest class of astronauts, number of women. They were profiled recently in a report I saw. They're all talking about that. They're, think, they're all hoping to get on that assignment. It's a ways away. And think about the trips to the moon. We're about a week, three days to get there, three days to come back, usually about a day there. We're talking about an enormous amount of time exactly. to get to someplace like Mars. This is really going to be some kind of endeavor for mankind and NASA? It, it depends on the kind of propulsion that you talk about how long it would take, but we're certainly talking months you know, to get to Mars. And so in order to prepare for that, we are you know, having destinations that are closer to home going to the moon, going to an asteroid. You know, people say, well, have we already been to the moon? Why go back? Well, there's so many things that we can learn about space flight and actually that we need to learn, you know, both in those, those uh, destinations that are beyond low Earth orbit, but still pretty close, but also in low Earth orbit itself. You know, if my fist is the Earth, then we're actually quite close to the Earth on that International Space Station. And it is a national laboratory where we are doing experiments every day in all sorts of different kinds of disciplines, basic research like combustion, fluid physics, material science, but also for technology. Because, you know, like for example, the, the water, uh, water recycling system that we use, the air recycling system that we use, they break more than once a month. And I don't know about you, but that's not the horse that I want to take to Mars. And it's, be, and it's not because stupid people designed them or they were designed poorly. It's because there's a lot of lessons to learn about how things work in low Earth orbit. And so we are learning those lessons. That International Space Station is a giant test bed. And, and that's another reason why you know, Scott's uh, participation up there for so long and having a really steady uh, record up there can be so important. But we're learning those technology lessons on that space station. And also down here, and I, I guess I, I always like to bring it back to Earth because it's where most of the people I know live, right? And all the things that we're trying to do for closed loop water, closed loop air, how could we live on Mars? How could we grow plants there? All those lessons are, if you had a sustainability expert sitting in this chair, they would be talking to you about that the same things were important to them. How do I recycle water when I don't have enough? How do I have a source of clean water? How do I recycle air? How do I grow plants in a place where there's not 
a sort of traditional growing ground. You know, even what everything from a, a desert in on another continent to vertical farming in a city. You know, some of the things that we need to know from Mars, learning about how can we use energy just for the wavelength of light that we need to grow plants. Well, it's valuable for vertical farming in our cities. So I like this connection between exploration technology and our needs and our needs right here on Earth for a sustainable planet. I've heard different dates and time frames thrown out through the last few months or so. What do you hear at NASA? What do you think? What are, what are people thinking may be a time frame for making a trip to Mars? I think it's still 30 years away. Now, it's, there's a lot of uncertainties and it really depends on how we get there. I've been really excited about the participation of our commercial partners. I mean, basically, I mean, I think you're gonna see the pace of going to Mars changing in that we're taking the things that we know how to do, we NASA. We know how to get stuff up and down to a space station in low Earth orbit, meaning right around, and we know how to get people up and down. So we're transferring those, those jobs to our commercial partners and companies like Orbital Sciences, Sierra Nevada, Boeing, and SpaceX. They are doing cargo and they're about to do people because we need to be able to focus the NASA resources on things that involve more risk than we can ask our commercial partners to do. And that means that our ability to make a dent in that date is, is, I think, going to increase, at least I'm hopeful. I know you'd rather talk about NASA than you, but you know, we all think of you as our Western Mass neighbor. <laughs> you're in a new assignment now, you're at NASA headquarters, DC. What can you tell us about what Katie Coleman's doing now for NASA? Um, I'm working for the chief technologist there, and it's a, it's a marvelous, amazing job. It has a lot to do with keeping an eye on technology and understanding, um, actually, you know, how to connect the people that we need around the planet which often is the people who are innovative, those small companies that, and, and interesting people, many of them young, that have great ideas. You know, we're a big government organization. And so in the chief technologist's office, we have prizes and challenges. You know, how do we actually get that innovation to Mars? You know, how do we get it for ourselves and for other government agencies? So things like prizes and challenges and innovation and crowdsourcing of data, uh, you know, or just using the people on the planet. So I'm working in all those things that involve technology, they involve people, but I also spend a lot of time helping communicate between uh, the NASA headquarters and, you know, the op more operational space station, just trying to explain, you know, really what's going on and what it's like. I got to ask you, I know you said it's a long way away, but if all things were equal, if it happened sooner on a better time frame, you'd love to make that trip to Mars if you could, wouldn't you? Oh, I would go in a minute, and I would go back up to that space station just to do some of the day-to-day -day work that needs done. Um, before we go, can I tell you uh, a story that Scott told me before landing? Just, um, you know, it's interesting, even though I'm at the headquarters, actually just as of this week, uh, but, you know, my heart's still back with my astronaut family and, you know, when one of us goes up on that space station, all of us are, are there with them. Uh, what's a neat tradition is that oftentimes the person who's already landed will call back, or we actually call them, and we'll have a little conference about what landing is like. And so Scott left the space station with his crew, landed, this was uh, five years ago, and myself and my crew were still up there. And so we called back right before our landing to explain what it was like, he goes, it is the most amazing thing. It is the e-ticket ride. I would go again just to land again. He said, it's like going over Niagara Falls in a barrel, on fire, <laughs> followed by a collision with a Mack truck. He said, it was the best thing ever. And that's why astronauts are different than the rest of us, I think. Maybe. But, uh, <laughs> so, braver and tougher and smarter, I think. We're all looking forward to uh, Scott and his crew uh, to their big day on, on Monday. But I know it's going to be hard for him, too. It's, it's really hard to, to leave that view of our planet. And it, it's, it's a big and wonderful place. And it's nice to go take a look at it and bring that view back to Earth. Well, NASA astronaut Katie Coleman, thanks so much. Good to have you with us, as always. Thanks for coming by. Well, I love coming here. You know that. Thanks for having me.